Film Hooligans bonus feature review. John and Jason here talking about documentary Never Be Done, the Richard Glenn Lett story. So what are we getting into tonight here? Well, I've been blacklisted from this place. Um, actually, I told him that it's blacklisted for me, and that's sort of the case, right? Uh, Explain why I can't do a set here. No, whatever. Okay. Eventually, we're going to be kicked out. He's been banned from lots of rooms, so. It was only a few months ago I, I toured from St. John's, Newfoundland, all the way to Tofino. I was, you know, like it was. I was on the top of my game. I thought, just uh, you know, a couple of months ago, and now here I am, New Year's Eve. I'm, you know, falling asleep on a couch with the, you know, surrounded by other homeless addicts. I was thinking about this, Roy that my first counselor's name was Roy as well, an old retired United Church minister. And he said to me way, way back, are you ready to accept that if you find the peace you're looking for, you might lose your livelihood? And I've made some big mistakes. Well, I acquired all this stuff, but then I lost my job and my home and I realized it's in everybody's way. And this represents me. And I realize that I'm a problem for a lot of people. And I'm trying to solve that. I'm going into treatment January 10th for three months. I don't want to be that hard, badass, edgy, dark, notorious Richard Lett. It's not fun for me anymore. So Jason, we are talking about a documentary again tonight. This is uh, from 2020, directed by Roy Tighe. This subject matter is actually probably a little near and dear to your heart. I don't know if the audience knows, but you kind of uh, I'm, a dr- I'm a drunk. Yeah, I'm an alcoholic <laughs> yes. who got cancer in a oh. so- ca- country with socialized medicine and was homeless for a while. Yep, this is me, totally. This is the Jason uh, Eugene Alt uh, story. You have been known to dabble in the stand-up comedic arts. So, there. you know, when I was watching this film, I kept thinking, I don't know, I, I'm like, I don't want to be too annoying, but I, I want to know how much of this is uh, this particular person in, in Richard Lett and how much of this is kind of the norm in the scene. How, what did you feel about watching a documentary about uh, stand-up comedy? This isn't a documentary about stand-up comedy. This is a documentary about an asshole. Hmm. And um, it's perfect. He happens to do stand-up comedy. Um, It's an art form that attracts a lot of assholes. A lot of what he said about... It was some of the subtler stuff. It wasn't really thematically tied to the film. So I feel like I got something different out of it than like a regular audience. Because he talked about how, like, he felt like he was trapped in a cycle of drinking. And so when he felt when he, like, couldn't drink, first because of chemotherapy and then secondly because he got sober, he had a hard time figuring out where stand-up fit in his life because it's really hard to separate stand-up and drinking. So, like, for me, that was the part of the film that resonated with me the most. And, like, most people watching it are just going to be like, oh, this guy's an alcoholic. But... As a comedian, you are an alcohol salesman Hmm. and you're plied with and paid with alcohol. Like, you know, your bonus checks are free booze and sometimes your paychecks are free booze. Like it's it's very much a culture that centers around drinking. So if you are trying to get sober, it's difficult to, to navigate stand up. And I think some people feel like they do it so much drunk that they like start spouting off pseudoscience about state dependent learning. They're like, I can't do my set sober now because I always do it drunk. And if I'm so I'm not, I'm not the same guy, it won't be funny. So I think a lot of his struggles with alcoholism was, it is similar to, to stuff I've gone through. I've done whole months where I just like detoxed. I'm like, I'm just doing sober October, 
you know, a, a lot of comics talk about that. Um, some people are like com- completely sober and some people are like, I just need to take a breather. But stand up comedy and drinking go hand in hand. So to see somebody realize that they are powerless over alcohol, I, th- I think was really illuminating. The documentary gets is spread out over 10 years, which is you kind of have to right. for something like this to see somebody progress at all as a person. But seeing how he sort of like came full circle at the end and, and found who he was as a comic without drinking, I thought was a nice end to it. And like, I'm not giving up. It's a documentary. There's no spoilers here, you know? Right, right. It's not Dear Zachary. It's just a pretty straightforward story about a comic, but is as realistic as you were hoping in a lot of respects. Yes. I think it took a little bit of bravery for this particular crew going through a the, the bottom of a person's life. I mean, he's... Richard was basically screaming at them at certain times because they're just like, you know, he's he's an addict. Like if someone like that is not uh, in the best frame of mind, not running with the the best uh, people at the time. And and aside from that, it was probably just heartbreaking to kind of have to be a spectator watching this person's life just completely crumble. I have to admit, I don't know a ton about Richard Lett before this. He is known, he's coined as the George Carlin of Canada, and, and he has a ton of work under his belt. Like if you if you look him up, he's been in he's been in like Supernatural and, and some other TV shows like Dark Angel. He's getting movie work now. Once a comic kind of reaches that that pinnacle or that that kind of basement of their life, and and I feel like everything after the, that they showed him doing his his material was better. You know, coming out out of the end of it, like just from a purely, is this funny or not? Because it seemed like he was kind of like a shock jock. You know, he just like pissing people off. So, and... so what happened was he had an act that worked, and like everything was working in his life. He was a functioning alcoholic. This right. movie is the it's the the, the tale of the twelve steps, right? Mm-hmm. So everything was working fine. So like, why would you update your whole act when you've got stuff that works? When you do sure. mean spirited crowd work in between your mean spirited jokes and like if someone makes a noise like they're offended, you just get to go off on them and your audience is with you because they're there to see you. So you've got a thing that's working, but then when you take time off and then you have to reboot, you're not going to be able to do the shit that worked in the 80s. Because mm-hmm. like a, a lot of the guys that are his age for his ilk, they have a pretty sweet deal. Like in, in Canada, it's a little bit different that the headliner is the person that actually like hosts the show. Usually the best comic hosts the show. Mm -hmm. So they do time up front. They do time in between comics and and stuff like that. You know, they do the most time, but they are the first comic out there in America. The worst comic is the first one to go out. The MC is the weakest comic on the show. So um, it's a little bit different in America. So if you have a, uh, like a spot like he did at Yuck Yucks when he's doing regular MC work, that's a steady paycheck. Plus you get to do a lot of time for a club crowd. So like he got so good just because he's doing hours every weekend and uh, his, his life was working, his act was working. And then like slowly he started to burn bridges until like he hit rock bottom. So it was really interesting kind of seeing, I mean, the 12 steps are bullshit sorry if you're working the program or whatever but that's all pseudoscience horseshit but at the same time like seeing everything play out kind of like in that order in his life i think was really interesting so this is basically just someone becoming a better person on camera over a period of years and uh he became a better comic because he bothered to write and and that's good he couldn't turn it off either. That's that's kind of the difference between him and a lot of comics. That's that's what got him canceled from all these places, right? It's he was the same character. Like it's one thing if you go up and you portray curmudgeonly character or you know profane person or whatever, but then when you get off, you're still a professional. He just was a train wreck on and off the stage. It seemed like that's how a lot of us are, I guess. Right? Like I'm not at his level and. Um... I probably never will be, but at the same time, like, I meet these guys, guys exactly like Richard Glenlett, that have been doing it as long and are sort of comfortable in the way their act is, and, you know, there's just a a lot of drinking around comedy, and it's not the best environment. And I've heard you talk about it before, about kind of going after 
a heckler or someone in the audience. And and I think I, I if I remember correctly, you said that you know you could really use that to to an advantage for that's like free material, right? If done yeah. properly, where it looks because the like, audience is the audience is on your side, but yeah. so. I have a different depending on how much time I'm doing. I have a different view about it because like there's some people that heckle at open mics and it's like, dude, I get five minutes and I'm trying to work on a six minute bit. Shut the fuck up, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But <laughs> if you're at a show where you get an hour, all of a sudden you're like, oh, let's talk to this idiot. Like people when you call out hecklers, usually if they are good natured, they will get embarrassed because they just wanted to yell some shit out. And then you're like, oh, let's pay attention to this person. So when they're embarrassed, they will say one or two word answers to your questions because they just want it to stop. And when they use one or two word answers, it gets you can sort of twist it and be like, oh, well, you said something vague. I'm going to spin it. And then all of a sudden you just have like a one or two minute conversation with somebody. No one gets mad at them, but it's just like it's free material. And Richard Lett did not use outbursts as an opportunity to get two minutes of free material. He really went after people. Yeah, because sometimes you're just like sometimes it throws you off and sometimes people repeatedly throwing you off like I will just abandon a punchline. If someone fucks me up in the middle of like a longer bit, I'll just be like, well, I'll just start another joke. And the audience doesn't really notice that's what happened. But you notice and it pisses you off because you're like if one person makes you abandon two or three punchlines, you know, it's just like, all, all right, that's enough. But mm -hmm. I mean, when you're an asshole and you are a drunk and you are drunk you're like a drunk who's drunk right. and you're an asshole when you're sober like you don't deal well with hecklers so like kind of seeing how he reacted to uh to stuff like that is it's not the ideal and i've seen i've seen every sort of way a headliner deals with this sort of thing and it's uh it's really fascinating to see everybody's different approach to it you know the People who haven't been doing it as long as him, but are more well known and, and better comics react a lot better. So this was just that was a symptom of him being a profoundly wounded and angry person. There, one of the other comics made a comment during the film where he said that he thinks that Richard Lett would have his career would have like blown up if he were in like England or the U S because kind of material thrives with those kind of audiences. Do you think that's true? Or, I mean, he still got, he still found a pretty high apex as far as what he was doing in Canada. Maybe, but like there's five guys like Richard led in Canada and there were 500 guys like Richard led in America. So maybe he would have been, yeah, but, but the, the material would have done better for like, the 80s crowd or whatever mm -hmm. cuz just like the mean shit but like at the same time so many people did it that you would have had to work harder to differentiate yourself so i think he actually probably peaked where he was because of there was less competition england maybe mm -hmm. cuz like comedy nerds can't name 10 british stand up comedians and the american general public can't name two so right like yeah maybe he would have done okay in england as much as Canada's polite, I think there's going to be a segment of the population that understands that when you tell a mean joke, you don't have to believe it. And you don't have to believe it to laugh at it either. So I I think someone like him is always going to find an audience. And I think he liked pissing people off. So that's going to work about as well anywhere, you know, which yeah. is to say not great about as well as it did. Right. I yeah. think he did about as well as he would have done anywhere. Yeah, that, that's totally fair. Like you said, there's there's way more of his ilk in in the in those places that he mentioned. So he he could have just got swallowed up in in the system even more and probably had less exposure just because it, it was more crowded field. Uh, but what he had in at Yuck Yucks was there are fewer opportunities to do that in America. Well, there's you know there's the same number, but they're you know way more comics. Sure. So. The opportunity to drive a long way for 400 bucks, if you're if you're someone that started when Richard Lett started and you're doing the kind of stuff he did, like, yeah, you'll get a lot of one nighters. You know, you, you will be able to work often. Mm -hmm. But the the acclaim he had in Canada 
I don't I don't think he would have gotten any more popular than he was there. Moving off of Richard as a person and just purely looking at this from a film perspective, because you, you and I have now done a couple of documentaries now, just as, like you said, this was filmed over 10 years, so it really had that, it, it really felt sh like shinier th than most of the other docs that we've kind of uh, reviewed on this show, like it felt more put together, probably because it had more time. You had, like I said before, it had mm -hmm. like some nice stylized inserts, like some good camera work. They probably, but they had a lot of time to kind of pick and choose and, and get rid of the fat a little bit more. You even have like an insert of the uh, this nice like animated uh, portion of it with like some koi fish uh, towards the end of the film. So, you know, I, I think purely from a, just a filmmaking point of view, I think this was one of the more effective docs that we've watched on the show. Yeah, and you know, when you have 10 years to put it together. Like this was shot over like a decade, so when they there was like no footage after 2017 and the doc came out in 2020, so like yeah, <laughs> they had quite a bit of time. There was no hurry putting this together. So like it, it came out on its own time and just yeah, it looked real polished. It actually won the best documentary feature at the Hollywood South Film Festival, which is actually a pretty prestigious uh, documentary festival. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's it's really out there for the public yet. Who would you recommend this to once it is uh, public? I think that this was so well produced and it gives so much insight into both comedy and alcoholism and, you know, that sort of struggle. It gives insight into the human condition. I feel like there are is so much that any group of people watching this could take away. And the the scenes he picked are entertaining. I think this yeah. is so well put together. There's not really anybody who's like above 14 or 15 years old that shouldn't see this movie. I don't really I can't think of anyone I wouldn't recommend this to because it's not about comedy, really. Right. It's about somebody hitting rock bottom and it, there's a redemption arc like this. This could have been scripted. That's how well, like the arc of this guy's life went when you picked out the right pieces. Roy Tig is uh, he's had experience. He's won some awards. He's a he's a good documentarian and he took his time with this and made sure he did a good job. And I think he's being recognized for it. And there's like, who would you not recommend this movie to? I think this is. This was just a good documentary. If you like documentaries, do not skip this one. And, and it was a good subject matter to portray all of those things, to put all those things in the spotlight, because Richard Lett is, like you said, this could have been scripted. He is so, what he's gifted at the most, I mean, he's a poet too. So, I mean, he sit, he's able to sit there and freestyle like an entire rap about not paying his bills for five minutes, and it comes off perfectly, and he was probably spun off of his head. That, that's why it feels so put together, because even at Richard Lett's rock bottom, he is such an articulate uh, individual, and that's, you know, he just just has that silver tongue that's why he gained the success he did why he was able to maintain the the lifestyle he did for so long veneer, without making yeah, any changes for sure you know? the only th thing that i would warn people like uh, potential viewers for this film is it does I mean, have some real tough language at times i mean you're getting some the worst of the worst like but again you're seeing a person at the, at their worst it's very raw it's very unedited mm -hmm. so you, you're gonna if you're sensitive to all that stuff maybe you know but i again i think it has such if you thing. don't like him you're you're happier for him i think at the end right that's why they showed him warts and all at the beginning right i, I can't wait for this to come out and everyone to see it uh, this is like i said before one of the better documentaries that we have reviewed on this <laughs> series so far so thank you for tuning in to film hooligans for a bonus feature review you could find me at john the host on twitter or at film underscore hooligans jason e alt where can everyone find you I'm Jason E. Alt on Twitter, and I got a pin post at the top that uh, talks about all the other things I do, except comedy. I guess I'm keeping that a secret. <laughs>